As we've seen so far in the course of this journey through Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, Part 1, published in 1722, the volume includes projects both modest in scale and aim and grandiose in terms of both. The preludes and fugues in C major and C minor were, if not exactly trivial compositions, certainly slight enough in their proportions to make for easy digestion. But then at the second stage of Bach's long climb up the chromatic scale, we encountered monumentality, with the C-sharp minor fugue being one of the longest and most rigorously worked out compositions in that style that Bach ever wrote. At the third stage, that of pitch class D, the constituent movements were again unpresumptuous in their objectives, at least as regards length, but at the E-flat level we again found ourselves keeping company with Bach the Towering Giant. The four movements I present today are again slender little compositions, models of formal clarity, economy of means, and brevity. Do you detect a pattern? I wonder how long it will hold. The E major prelude is a contrapuntal exercise for the two hands, adopting a cheerful, plain air character and flowing along its leisurely course in agreeable 12-8 time. This movement is organized in three paragraphs, which correspond in more than just a rough way to the ideal of sonata form, an approach to be fully worked out in the generations following Bach, but unmistakably present here in embryonic form. The opening paragraph makes the tonic to dominant journey expected of an exposition, the second paragraph sets forth a brief development, and the third is the return. Interestingly enough, that culminating paragraph is simply a transposition of the opening paragraph, a fourth higher or fifth lower, take your pick, so that following its established course naturally brings us back to the tonic to finish. It's the same journey that Mozart took in the first movement of his C major sonata, Kirschel 545, and that Franz Schubert also found useful for the opening movement of his Fifth Symphony. The brief fugue that follows is an energetic and cheerful thing, presenting its argument by means of three fugal expositions that establish the key, move away from it into the relative minor, and then return. The two members of this E major set, in other words, are closely analogous in their construction, yielding a strong sense of formal balance and integrity. Some of the things I've said about the two E major movements also apply to those in E minor, which clock in just a little longer than their E major companions, but not by much. The prelude is, in this case, in two distinct parts, both built on the same melodic motive. Here's how that works. In part one, the left hand provides a steady, gentle current of 16th notes above which the right hand punctuates the flow with detached chords on beats one and three, while also reeling out a ruminative, improvisatory style cantilena. This is all very sober and sometimes touching, but the prelude will not continue in this vein. Instead, the modulatory impulse seizes the music and drives it into A minor, and the tempo suddenly quickens to twice its previous pace, with that gentle current of 16th notes now becoming the basis for a furious, brow-mopping two-part invention that closes the movement. That two-part writing is then retained for the E minor fugue, which provides a clear example of a claim I made several videos ago, that fugue is not a musical form, but rather a musical procedure based on an imitative ideal, and there are any number of ways that a composer can shape that procedure to create works whose overall design can be quite unforeseen. In the present case, we have a fugue that's actually a two-part invention, consisting only of a series of two-voice fugal expositions, each of which modulates internally to its minor dominant. Thus, the opening exposition sets forth the highly chromatic subject in E minor and B minor, and a short modulating passage follows, conducting the music to the next tonal center for the next exposition, which traces then the same pattern. The formal approach I just sketched holds true for the entire movement, and the overall effect is just remarkable. 
I find it quite similar, formally speaking, to the final movement of the same composer's E major violin concerto, a rondo movement utterly regular in its phraseology and predictable in its course. This little E minor fugue, if it even is that, is just as satisfying, and hearing all of this WTC music on pitch class E leaves me feeling as exhilarated as Bach himself must have felt upon composing it. The pianist in this beautiful recording is Tatyana Nikolaeva. <laughs> 